Well, we just read Matthew 10, a bit of Matthew 10. It's a snippet of the instructions that Jesus gives after telling his disciples to go out, to go out and to preach and to teach and to heal. And these instructions of Jesus are not what one would expect. I mean, I, for one, expected some kind of great motivational speech, perhaps a Martin Luther King Jr.'s, I have a dream, or perhaps John F. Kennedy's, asks not what your country can do for you, but what can you do for your country? No, what they receive from Jesus, and I'm paraphrasing, what they receive from Jesus is a clear hierarchy. No servant is above his master. They receive an expectation of persecution. They call me Beelzebul. You can expect much worse. And possibility of death. And not just this, the death that they may expect, that may happen, they are not to fear, but embrace. And of course, there's a loyalty. Hate your family. Love me, says Jesus. I mean, wow. It's a wonder why these guys didn't run for the hills, yeah? But Jesus is like no other leader. He never sugarcoats things. He makes no apologies for the war that he is sending them into, the war that he is preparing them for. And make no mistake, they are going to war. And it is a war like no other, for in this war there are no guns, there are no bombs. Instead, what they can expect, what they will experience is much worse. Their war, our war, is against the prince of darkness himself, Satan. It's against their own temptations. It's against the desires of the flesh. So no, Jesus gives no fancy motivational speech for us this morning. He gives us no coffee mug quote. Instead, he uses every moment for telling the truth, every moment left to prepare his followers, for what lies ahead. Three things we see, I think, this morning in this truth-telling. First thing we see is a clarity. Jesus makes it clear that the religious leaders, they hate him. They think he is the devil of hell, no less. And they will hate those who proclaim his message. Jesus gives a real certainty. They say in life there are two things you can expect, death and Taxes, not true. What is true, though, is proclaim the kingdom of God and there will be a cost. There will be a price paid. Third thing is the loyalty. This is no ordinary war that they are walking into. And if they're going to be able to fight this battle, to walk the walk and talk the talk, then they're going to need to love, to know and to love the one they fight with and for. Clarity, certainty, loyalty. Three things they need. Three things that we need in our continuing battle against the prince of darkness. Three things that will help us as we seek to proclaim the kingdom of God. Teach, preach, and heal, if you remember last week's message. Let me pray. We'll run through those three things, and then hopefully we'll land somewhere helpful. Lord Jesus, thank you for your great love. Open our hearts and minds to your work and your ways. Use this passage to prepare us for what you have ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew 10, verse 24, and this is Jesus speaking. It's basically all Jesus speaking, and it starts with a clarity. The student is not above the teacher, says Jesus, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebul, How much more the members of his household. Like I said, there are no coffee mug quotes here, no great motivational speech, but there are some serious truths. The first one is Beelzebul. It is actually a play on words. One would expect the word that they use is Beelzebul. They would have expected Jesus to use Beelzebub. Beelzebub is the word from the Old Testament that the Bible uses to refer to the prince of demons, to Satan himself. And if you remember Satan back in, you remember Satan himself back in Matthew 9 is who they accused Jesus of working for. It is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons, said the Pharisees. But Beelzebul is a different word. And this word, it literally means Lord of the high place. Now, that doesn't sound so bad at all, does it? 
except when they use it of Jesus. It's done with a sarcasm and a laugh. They're not referring to a holy high place, but the heights of the stench of a dung heap. Beelzebul in this context means Lord of the dung heap or Lord of the flies. So yes, Jesus is saying, they call me Lord of the dung heap. What do you think they're going to call you? It's not a coffee mug quote, although if we printed some quotes, cups with quotes on them, you know, Jesus, Lord of the dung heap, I'm pretty sure we'd probably sell quite a few. What do you reckon? Little has changed. Anyway, I reckon this is a great opener. I reckon this is a bit of an icebreaker for the disciples. But it's very real, isn't it? It's very real. And we wouldn't necessarily expect sarcasm from Jesus, but here it is. And this is the point, isn't it? Jesus just loves them so much. Loves them too much to tell them a fairy tale, to mislead them. He loves them too much. He cares too much for the mission ahead to have them thrown off by teasers and threats and lies that will surely come as they did for Jesus. He wants them to have an absolute clarity of what it means to go out and tell people about the good news, to invite people on Alpha, to proclaim the kingdom of God. Yes, my fellow lords of the dung heap, this is who they will say we are, or at least they'll treat us like, I won't use that word, not from the pulpit. Look, on a tangent, I am so proud of this church. Ali and I have been here, what, five and a half years. It didn't take long for the Holy Spirit to draw in people who have a real gift of evangelism, telling people about Jesus, going out in the streets, knocking on doors, all of that stuff. It's not the be-all and end-all. It's just one part of the body of Christ. But I am impressed. I am tickled pink is the word I used at Synod about something. But I think it's appropriate here too this morning. We prayed for them. We send them out. You guys embrace them. And this is not normal. Many churches would give lip service to such work, but they wouldn't want to take the risk of having a backlash of offence when someone's offended to hear the gospel. But you bless them, you receive them, and that makes me very proud. Clarity. Truth matters. We don't do people any favours telling them that this Christian ride's an easy walk in the park. We tell them the truth. Because Jesus wants them to have a certainty of what's ahead. Certainty that he is with them. Certainty that he will never forsake them. Even in death, he's got their back. Have a look at verse 28. This is Jesus speaking again. Do not be afraid, he says, of those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. He's not talking about Satan. He's talking about God alone. It is God alone who can destroy both the soul and the body. So fear him and only him. And do his work of proclaiming the gospel with a reckless abandon. For you are known and loved by me, says Jesus, by the creator. And he illustrates this next with the story of the sparrows and the penny in verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? They're basically worthless. Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. If he cares so much for a worthless sparrow, for you he counts the hairs on your head. They're numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Can you see what we're talking about? They can be, they can be certain that no one other than God truly knows them. And no one other, in God, other than God has the real power over them. Life and death is controlled by the one who created it. And it is he alone that they should fear. Not these silly playground bullies trash talking their way up the food chain. Make no mistake, says Jesus. Those who tease me, those who refuse to recognize who I am, well, they will be excluded from the kingdom of heaven by God himself. Verse 32, 
For whoever acknowledges me before others, again, Jesus speaking, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Let me summarize. They can be certain that Jesus is with them. They can be certain that God knows them. They can be certain that those who are perishing, those who are rejecting Jesus, they will attempt to drag them down along with them. Clarity. Truth matters. Eyes wide open, it matters. This walk with Christ is powerful, it is wonderful, full of blessing and hope, but it's no walk in the park. Besides, who'd want that anyway? And I don't see it here. What I see here is a people with gumption, climbing a mountain, traversing that narrow path. I see people creating stories of faith in their lives and leaving a legacy for the future. And when it comes to your funerals, my brothers and sisters, I will rejoice. I will rejoice. Standing here, doing your funeral, talking to your relatives about you, I will rejoice because we will see you again. Certainty, Jesus is with them. Number two, God knows them and those who refuse the truth will not go quietly. And of course, loyalty in verse 34, Jesus still speaking to us says this, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Now that's a pretty hard pill to swallow, except maybe the daughter-in-law and the mother-in-law. They never get on well, do they? There's more truth-telling here, more clarity, more certainty, a peek into what lies ahead, but it's mostly about loyalty. Jesus is not saying that their family will be against them. He's not saying that any family will be against itself, not literally speaking. It's a comparison. It's to show us how deep the division is between Jesus and those who reject him. It's to show us the division between those who hold to the old ways, the old wine, the old patch, the endless sacrifices, the corruption of the leaders, the corruption of self, and those who follow Jesus, those who drink of the new wine, the new garment, the new way, the truth, the way and the life, of course. And in this new way, a loyalty is required. A loyalty towards Jesus is demanded of the twelve. As Jesus says in verse 37, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Did we just see what happened? Here and in the last couple of verses, something changed. Did we see it? Anyone who loves, whoever does. Jesus is no longer speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to you and me. And it couldn't be more clear. Love what's behind us more than Jesus and you are not worthy. Love what is before us that is not of his kingdom and you are not worthy. In fact, love your own life more than Jesus and you are not worthy. Not just his disciples, all of us. And the last word for today's reading is verse 39. And it speaks of another truth, not for the disciples, but for them, but for us as well. Verse 39. Whoever, that's you and me, finds their life will lose it. If you find your place on earth, You will lose it. And whoever, that's you and me, loses their life for my sake will find it. I can think we can agree this is a pretty challenging bit of text. And I know it's tempting to look at the preacher out the front and think, easy for you to say, you don't have a real job, 
or a mortgage or all of that other stuff that we have to worry about. But please listen carefully. Honestly, I find it harder than ever to give my whole life to Jesus, my whole self. See, the problem is the harder I try, the more I do, the more blessing that we seem to receive. The things that used to be mountains are now molehills. And I can attest to what Paul says without blinking an eye. Paul says that it is a blessing to have your faith tested. And I'm not the only one who's been there. The things that used to be mountains, they have become molehills. And he is right. You, my brothers and sisters, you have a real power in your corner now. To quote the genie from Aladdin. But this power is no genie. The power you have in your corner is the power of all creation. The power of the one who made all of it. He's empowering you, carrying you. He will bring you through every trial, every mountain, every valley. And somehow, don't ask me how, he will bring good of it too. Somehow he brings good of even the hardest and most difficult things. Never feels like it at the time, but he does. Clarity. Truth matters. Eyes wide open matters. Let's name the struggles we face. Let's admit what's holding us back. Let's talk about what prevents us from doing his work. And step in. Certainty. Jesus is with us. He's with you. God knows you. He will never forsake you. Nothing can shake or dislodge his spirit that is within you. As Ray loves to say, it's vacuum-packed. It's sealed in there. And nobody's taken that away from you. Whatever you face, he's with you. And Jesus demands a loyalty. Everything else aside, it must always be about Jesus. There is no place in this church for personal gain, for a hidden agenda. Of course, we will gain much in the doing, but it must never be our intention. It must never be our focus to receive. So brothers and sisters, let me just wrap this up. Tell people about the good news. And when you do expect a splashback, but know that Jesus has got your back, that the kingdom of heaven is waiting for you. And I, for one, am looking forward to it. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your great love. We thank you that you are with us. You've got our back. You're driving us forward, making the mountains low and the valleys high. Pray, Lord Jesus, keep us on the path. Let us encourage each other. And we can't wait for that day where we see you in eternity. No more tears, no more pain, no more suffering, but glorious song before the Lamb who was slain for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.